All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, this is such a pleasure to spend a Friday night with these two. Uh, my name is Trey Shields. I'm the senior programmer of the festival, as well as the Philadelphia Film Society. And I'm so honored to welcome two guests from Marionette Land. We have director Alexander Minnelli. Hello. <laughs> and then we have larger in life subject, Robert Brock. <laughs> Hi, hello, thank you for watching. I hope you like the picture. So as always, uh, feel free to submit a question and I will certainly field them for you and ask these guys. But in the meantime, I got plenty of questions myself. I love that Rob refers to it as a picture. The whole time we were filming and the whole time afterwards, he always refers to it as, you know, is the picture done? I love the picture, it's a great picture. So I, I love the picture. that. I That's love very classic movie. Hollywood of you. I feel That's like it's called the picture. <laughs> um, so of course, early advertising, you referred to it as a motion picture documentary, Al. I, I did, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I mean, it's a classic question, but it's always really interesting with documentaries. Um, so those for you, if you didn't see the intro of the film, uh, Alex had a film previously uh, called At the Drive-In where he followed interesting characters behind the screen and in front of the screen at the Mahoney Drive-In Theater. Um, but what's really interesting now with this one is, how did you find Robert, Alex? Or how did Robert find you? Well, I, I found Rob and it was 2014. Um, I moved to Lancaster in 2012 uh, to take a job at Franklin and Marshall College. And I didn't know anybody in town. So I kind of made short documentaries about people and things just to kind of learn about the city. And I was walking down a street I've never been down and I saw a marionette theater, which you don't see in every town. So I was instantly uh, kind of intrigued and walked in and was floored and, you know, wanted to kind of make a short documentary about it. And then I met Rob and it was like, oh, well, it's, it's him. It's not, forget the theater, it's him. So made a short film about him, but I always knew there was more to that. I always knew I wanted to come back to Rob and uh, it took us six years, but we did it. Hmm. Yeah, and I really loved you're just um, capturing the space and Robert, um, let alone just the first opening shot of you following him down the stairs. And it really sets the stage that this is your life, this is your home. And it's like, it makes it set up for a really magical space. Yeah, that, um, that shot. You know my side of the story, how we met. How By the you... way, Rob, Rob's going to interrupt us so many times. Like, just you don't even have to ask any questions, Trey. I, I, Rob, <laughs> he'll just take over. So get ready. Cool. Um, but Robert, what was it like to have Alex following you around? Well, it, it, well, let me tell you first. I got an email from this guy saying I'm a filmmaker, and I thought, yeah, everyone with an iPhone is the filmmaker these days. Another crackpot. And then he had a link to one of his documentaries, and I believe it was Juggle. And I watched that and I immediately recognized his talent and I emailed him back uh, immediately and we set up the meeting and we went from there. And in that short, uh, and we made it, plus his name's Manelli, you know, it's not, it's not spelled the same as Liza and <laughs> yeah. Vincent, but he's just as talented. And I think how we sort of had an instant connection and what I found especially special about Man with Puppet, in nine minutes, he captured the heart and soul of the theater. And I thought that was amazing. That also won two awards. It, he's, he's very uh, modest. Now, that talented Al. You being a natural performer, but this being a documentary behind the scenes and on the stage, did you find yourself performing even when you were off the stage for the camera? Um, I, I, well, it's hard when you're sitting down and doing the interviews and it's hard if you're talking about serious subjects. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you, I think humor is the great leveler and I think it's good if you can laugh about everything, no matter how tragic. And tragedy and humor, you know, run hand in hand. So um, I think it's obvious when there's times when I'm being funny. And I think it's obvious when there's times I'm being, being honest and being myself. Now- That answer your question. Yeah, of course. Um, now, I think you just, you mentioned before, I forget, just to be clear, you did not, have you seen the full film? Because you didn't watch it tonight. 
No, I actually, I did. I was too worried about my internet connection. I'm having trouble, but I watched it earlier in the day because I wanted to be the boned up on it. The first copy of I saw was like the fourth cut. And then I watched it earlier today and I thought, well, I could watch it on my phone because I wanted to see your introduction. And then I've been testing the, the Zoom connection all day because I wanted to oh. look good on Zoom. I do want to highlight not only your uh, getup, but also the masks on the uh, puppets behind you. Good touch. I, we're gearing up to do a YouTube show called Marionette Gaieties, and it's going to be an old fashioned variety show and doing PSAs uh, with the puppets and mask wearing and washing hands, et cetera, et cetera. Ooh. Now, when you finally- They were not as easy to put on as I thought they were a pain in the ass, but <laughs> I got them all on. So when you finally saw the film, how do you feel about how you were portrayed? Because you know, a lot of times with documentaries, they say the editing room dictates kind of the film. I, I trust Al explicitly. I think he's an incredible uh, a filmmaker and I predict he will win an Oscar someday. Right. Now I got a first question. Um, so despite all the obstacles that you face, especially with COVID-19, what keeps you going, my friend? <sighs> well, it's not always easy, but my mother and I uh, often say we have it luckier than most. We have a nice house. I can still come down and work in the theater. Uh, I'm not always inspired at this time and you just have to keep keep going. Okay. How do any of us, you know, <laughs> look at what you're going through in Philadelphia right now. My heart goes out to all my brothers and sisters in Philly and, and of course the Wallace family. So it's day by, in AA they have, um, a platitude day by day. And sometimes it's hour by minute and so hour by hour and sometimes it's minute by minute. So I just kind of, I have good days and bad days, but don't we all these days? Of course. And the dogs, thank God for the dogs. Same here. They love, they love the quarantine. Yeah. Have you tried leaving the house yet? Because they once, once the dogs get used to you being there, they put up quite oh. a fight once you leave. <laughs> well, which seldom happens because we've been in self quarantine yeah. since March 7th, pretty much. All right, I got another question. Um, so, the Peter Pan production, what will be different about the new Peter <laughs> Pan production once you're able to open it? Well, they won't be muslin puppets, I'll tell you that. I hated the muslin stage, which I think if you've watched the film, you know that. Uh, it, the one thing, if I eventually want to shoot the productions, but you can't shoot them just one camera. You have to really shoot them cinematically, which takes a lot of time. So I want to redo sets and I can focus just on one puppet as opposed to being on hooks me, then grab the crocodile to make him. So um, I want it to look more cinem cinematic. Well, that. I got another question. Um, this is actually a great like follow-up. So Robert's home and the marionettes, particularly the Peter Pan marionettes, uh, took on their own role in the film through elaborate close-ups and cinematic framing. Um, Alex, can you speak about the role of the house above the stage and the marionettes played in the process of filming? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I could actually see the question too. Oh, cool. Sorry, I was, I was reading it as you were speaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the role about the house above the stage and the marionette. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, the most interesting thing was that he lives above the theater. I, and and it, it's such a, it was such a perfect metaphor for everything. And, um, you know, you were saying before, Trey, you're talking about that shot following Rob down the steps. Originally, there had been dialogue in there and him kind of explaining it. And I figured it would be more interesting because I guess there's going to be, I always forget that I know Rob so well because I've known him for like six years now and I consider him a friend. So I know that he lives above the theater, but I forgot, oh, most people who watch this film aren't going to know that. So um, that's why I took that out and just kind of following him down to be this sort of slow reveal. 
Um, and I, so I wanted that to kind of, the house is almost like a character in itself. Uh, and then, you know, the marionettes, uh, there's a reason that I focused on certain shows and not like Rob does tons <clears throat> of shows, but there's a reason certain shows were chosen, you know, Wizard of Oz, Peter, Peter Pan specifically, um, kind of played a, a big role in the film. And, um, I, I'm sad we didn't get shots of the marionettes with masks on for the film, but, uh, at least people can see them now in the Q and A. Yeah. And how many hours were you, would you say you filmed in total? Cause six years is a long time to know each other. Um, did you well, spend we, well, days at a time, we, weeks at a time? We filmed for about a month or so in 2014. That was to make the short. And I used a lot of that stuff in this. So the whole beginning of the film, which I kind of consider like a prologue where we're kind of seeing him with the Peter Pan puppets and doing some of that, that was all shot in 2014. Then again, in 2017, Rob, you changed the name and you had a big sort of party. Yes, yes. Filmed some stuff there. But then uh, in August of 2019 is when we really started shooting Marionette Land. So yeah, like a year later and we had a, a finished film because I had a lot of stuff already shot. And, and the majority of the production was in the can. I mean, the majority of, the, of, of photography had ended. And then COVID-19 came and that sort of added an extension onto it. Yeah. yeah. So well, it, gonna, it, gave us, it gave us the perfect ending, I think, in terms of the last shot. Because I don't think, I don't know, Rob, we might not have, the, the ending might have been, the ending would have been different for sure. I don't think that moment in the last shot would have been there, which I think is what sort of brought the movie together and kind of revealed what, you know, it was really about so i like dorothy singing at the end that's my favorite <laughs> I well do. i certainly want to get back to the inclusion not only in the filmmaking process but your experience with covid19 but i got some more questions so have you ever considered doing a children's television show are you talking talking to me yeah I mean, well, Alex, too, you can chime in. Well, Marionette Gaieties isn't necessarily a children's show. If we shoot the productions, they would be for children. But believe it or not, uh, the majority of our audience is grown-ups, even for the children's shows, because they want to see marionettes and they look for children to bring. And uh, uh, the majority of the time, there's more grown-ups uh, than children, and and in the film, I quote Sherry Lewis, who was always said, always write up to children, never write down to children. It makes them more savvy, and I couldn't agree with that more. I particularly like it when there's daddies and granddaddies in the audience because they laugh more freer. <laughs> and as Mary Lou says, the villains always. Uh, um, there's never any unhappy endings. The villain, villainy is redeemed. We could now, only do that in life. Now, do the marionettes, uh, is another question from the audience, do the marionettes get redressed as different characters for the different shows? No. We it, have well, per show? there's a few exceptions. Uh, you can't, it's very difficult to change marionette costumes on stage when you're running lights and running sounds and running marionettes. So, and well, I don't have any out. Uh, uh, Cinderella, there's, this, there's two marionettes. There's Cinderella in rags and Cinderella in the ball gown. And then there's the, the fairy tale repertory company. So the cast for Cinderella is the cast for Rumpelstiltskin, is the cast for Sleeping Beauty, is the cast for Here Comes Peter Cottontail. Having said that, we did a show on Ben Franklin at his 300th anniversary of his birth. And then uh, Rockford, which is a local uh, 18th century revolutionary general's home here in Lancaster, I did, uh, it was called Marionettes in the Mansion. So I gave Ben Franklin a haircut and gave him epaulets and took his fur off and turned him into Dr. General Edward Hand. And now he's become the king with the epaulets. So that that I have changed, but it's not easy to change costumes on marionettes, but they're easier than actors. <laughs> they're always there for their costume fittings. 
you can hot glue right on their body and they never complain. Um, so Alex, uh, I want to talk about a little bit of the, the framing of the entire story because you said it started as a short. And then as the movie goes on, I feel like it's kind of like, like the cliche of peeling the onion back a little bit, but it's definitely like, um, like individual like nuggets of story and information. Mm -hmm. uh, did you just kind of keep falling upon these moments or stories? Uh, how did you decide like what to include, what not to include? Uh, yeah, I mean, the way, and, and at the drive-in was kind of like that as well. It's, it's more, it's more vignette in a way. Um, you know, I think the, this film certainly has a sort of prologue and, and then there's sort of a series of vignettes, you know, there's the, him getting ready for the grown-up show and then the actual, you know, rehearsals of that. And then, you know, I love when they're writing down notes. I mean, it just really has to be something that kind of interests me. I don't really go into it saying, this is what the story is gonna be. I mean, obviously for this, the way it unfolded, there was no way to plan for this. Originally, I thought that gala, the 30th anniversary gala was going to be the ending. You know, I was envisioning it as kind of um, like the ending of Rushmore where it's like this sort of big party and you see all the characters and they're all talking. So I thought, okay, this big party could be the ending of the film um that didn't happen and it became just the whole you know third act is just robbed by himself almost so it's the exact opposite um and i shot some of that cinematography and it made it into the film and you and got, got your credit you got your credit you got your imdb credit um but uh yeah so i mean really it's just i i try to find what interests me about what's happening. So I don't necessarily follow a, a, a precise story. I'm more following a sort of, it, it's more it's more of like a novel, a novelistic approach to it where there's chapters instead of, you know, here's cause and effect, this scene leads to this scene, leads to this scene. There's moments of that, but overall it's, it's, more, it's more like a novel. Mm -hmm. So Robert, Sir. Was it different uh, you shooting yourself? Well, can you talk about that experience? Because that is such like a um, stark contrast, but it worked really well with the map. Al promised me a list of specific things he wanted. I never got a specific thing. Rob, my 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 direction to you was simply film you doing the most. Oh no 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 no! You said I'm going to give you a specific list of I things. I did. I said making dinner working on your puzzles i said just anything boring i want to see and you delivered <laughs> he's lying it, it was difficult at times um and then i did make him promise because you turn that camera on and sometimes you forget it's not playing so i did make al promise that i there's those scenes with me running down the theater in my underwear or scratching something inappropriate which he didn't put in now, did you find yourself more <laughs> self-conscious? What? Uh, did you find yourself more self-conscious? What, because you were the one having the power to turn on and frame yourself? No, once it was, set, well, it was frightening seeing yourself in the monitor sometimes. And, but now if, if, if I was, if I was shooting like a long segment, you just sort of forget the cameras there. Now, towards the end of the film, during these moments, uh, I believe there's at least one or two shots where you're watching maybe a past performance. And you kind of, it's like this moment where it's like a reflection, not only on like your past performances, but on the film that's come before. But now seeing this film, do you have this kind of reflection? Do you, have you had any epiphanies upon seeing this completed film? I think it's a beautiful film. I think Lancaster looks absolutely beautiful. And there's a, a wonderful story I'd like to tell. I'll try to make it short. My dear friend, Lynn Bessaker died uh, during COVID. And obviously I wasn't able to go to her service. The family warned me ahead of time, so I knew it was coming. But the day Lynn died, there was a, a beautiful rainbow in the sky. And Scott Stoltzfus was shooting um, yeah. Jeff, Scott, thank you. Al, uh, what's that called? The, oh, the drone? 
The drone. So he got a drone of the rainbow, and that's Lynn Bessicker's rainbow, and that's how the movie opens. So that I I just about lost it when I saw that, and to me that's Lynn Spirit approving the film. I didn't answer your question. What was your question? No, I think that's that's perfect. I mean, just reflecting upon seeing this product, so I know you've watched past performances of yourself. And that was great. I hate watching myself. I have to say, I absolutely hate watching myself. Uh, and it never failed when I was here to film a performance. I never thought it was my best. The fog machine didn't work in Sherlock. And, um, but I, I see all the, I hear me singing flat. I hear all the wrong notes, uh, but that's just the performer, the performer in me. But it, it, my favorite segments are the musical segments. Well, I that I just think are beautiful. Trey, I think you kind of hear the sort of perfectionist in Rob coming out, and I and I hope that was portrayed in the film, especially in the middle when we kind of show him and uh, you know uh, practicing and and you're you're telling Brenda, you know, oh the the air conditioner is open and put the light up here and put the camera here and just the that attention to detail and how serious he takes everything and wants everything to be perfect. I mean, when they were taking literally handwritten notes about the Divas and Dame show, that was, I knew, I knew I was going to be proud and happy of this piece because that is exactly what I love about Rob is, and, and, and even the guys at the Mahoning is when you take it that serious, when it, when it is so serious, and where other people are like, why wouldn't he do that? Like to me, taking notes, writing them down was just, I, I had no idea that was going to happen. And it just blew my mind and I loved it. And it was just, I thought that was a perfect encapsulating scene of Rob and that perfectionist side. And he'll never be happy with anything, you know, uh, of himself. Occasionally, out there. occasionally there's moments, but that's my conservatory training. And and you know, I've been trained since a child, and you you take notes, you get notes, and you take them, and you if you don't write them down, you don't remember them. Yeah, and so I feel like that's why. I'm sorry, uh, that's why people watch films about artists. Like we've seen you perform already. Like we get that aspect, but we actually want to see what goes on up here, like the cogs turning and thinking, and like. Well, that can be a little scary. <laughs> But that's what's the most interesting part about this film. You know, I mean, there is like the, the sellable line about, yeah, you're a guy who runs a marionette theater, but it's also like, what makes you tick? What goes on to put it all together? And I think you guys did that so beautifully. To me, the puppet is always the extension of the actor. That's so right. what an actor has the whole body to do, you have manipulating the strings and through, and, a lot of uh, puppet theaters don't use, they don't do it live. It's not one man. And I think for me, that's, that's the special, that's, that's the special effect. Plus I can play all the roles and I don't have to audition and I don't have to go through that God awful rejection that actors have to go through constantly. Rob, Rob is just quoting the movie now, Trey. So <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> Um, he has said to me during the shooting of this, he says, do you know how many times I have you saying that exact thing? Well, when you do tours, you just get your batter together. Yeah. I always call them like back pocket comments. Like you just have yeah. them back there. You know exactly like how to explain or describe something. Well, My back saw, pockets are stuffed. You saw <laughs> in the beginning of the movie where Rob was talking about his muslin stage and he, he told I me that. My muslin stage. Four different four different times and I kept telling him every time I'm like yeah you, you talked about this but so I thought showing that montage because that's how he is he's he has that performer yeah you know he has those nuggets ready to go so all right I got probably most likely the final question from the audience um Rob what do you think about the way the film portrays your relationship with Mary Lou or Nanny Lou well there's one thing I really, really regret in the film. And it's when I say I thought my mother was playing to the camera. And uh, it, it, it hurt my mother deeply. 
And I, I, I apologize to my mother for that because that's the last thing I want to do. And that's, that's the one thing that, that bothers me. In my defense, after she did this, how proud she was of me, she said, and I'm always excited to go on the next adventure with him. And that's what I was referring to play to the camera, which isn't in the film. But I would not want to hurt my mother. And I know that hurt her deeply. Does that, that doesn't really answer your question. What was your no, question? I mean, that's probably arguably more interesting than, I mean, that's a really solid anecdote. That was great. We, we have, um, some people compare us to Big and Little Evie. We don't have a hundred cats, we don't have raccoons, and we don't both sing. I sing all the time, but not, not Nanny Lou. Now, um, so wrapping this up. And I, I couldn't know. do it without my parents. I would not have been able to do this without my parents. So I'm very grateful to my parents and all our sponsors, all our angels and archangels to Al, uh, cause he gets me and not, it's not always easy to get me. And when you were talking about the, the documentary part and answering him, it was very easy because we established this friendship. So it was very on, it was very easy to be honest uh, talking to Al. Yeah. Now, uh, wrapping this up though, we gotta know, what's the state of the Marionette Theater? I know you have this upcoming performance, but what's going on? How's the YouTube channel? Cause that's where we're kind of- Well, I'm up to 125 YouTube subscribers. Cool. So if you like the film, go to Like Us to Marionette YouTube, subscribe. Uh, you need to have a thousand subscribers to make it work. You have to, you can't use any copyrighted music. So I'm writing music. I haven't studied theory in a long time. And I really want to try to get into this. In the beginning of the pandemic, I would go down regularly and practice and do a theory class and take a tap class. And then you sort of got, I gained 10 pounds during the COVID. If I'd have to perform, my costumes wouldn't fit me. So I'm trying to make that turn. But I said to my mother the other day, if we never reopen, if, if the theater closes, uh, we went out on top. We have Al's wonderful movie, the wonderful article from the Lancaster Papers, being part of the Philadelphia Film Festival and ending with the standing ovation. So as Mama Rose says in Gypsy, if you're gonna go out, go out a star. So I figure if I have to go out, I went out on top. But I'm planning to keep it going some way or another. Great. And Alex, what's the uh, future of the film? Any uh, news or any other plans creatively? Um, well, this is the first film festival. So the film festival journey, which will be unusual and different this time around because yeah, of the use of the Zooms for now. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, so th this will be uh, th for the foreseeable future. It'll probably be like this. Uh, just, you know, waiting, waiting to hear from all the film festivals. Um, and then we'll see. Yeah. Trying to trying to get distribution. Um, you know, at the drive-in got distribution and this festival was certainly a big help to that. So hopefully um, this film uh, can get picked up by someone. Um, there's a lot of extra content that would be great for a DVD. So uh, we have lots of Rob on the cutting room floor. <laughs> um, but yeah, we just want more people to see it and uh, to learn about, you know, Rob and his theater, so. Selfishly, my regret is we can't see it with an audience. Yeah, and an audience response. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to hear. I just want to hear an audience's response to when the snow machine falls, because to me, I feel like I dropped the f bomb. You did, and to me, I just I would love to be in a packed house with that moment. So yeah. I was not happy at that moment, but it is it is funny. Well, yeah, well, hopefully down the road, uh, that can happen either with us or with the future of Film Fest. Um, I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank here you. Tonight. Thank you, Al. I, I, Al, I love you. I don't know you that well, but I love you already. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And rate the film. Don't Can't you go and rate it, give it stars? Go yeah. give it stars. We yeah. have an audience award. Be sure to tell your friends and family about this. I will be posting.
Yeah. This film's available to watch via us until end of Monday. So you still got plenty of days to tell friends. I've been posting that too. And it's on it's on Letterboxd and IMDb. So send, you know, give it a rating, give it a review. And all right. And I can't make a better comment from the audience than just tell Robert we miss him so. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you later, guys. All right. Bye. Bye, Al. Bye.